Good afternoon, everybody. Today we're talking about the infectious cycle. We're going to talk about what it is and how we study it, what we can learn from it. And then we'll talk about how we measure viruses and a variety of issues related to that. And then finally, we'll talk about methods that are used in virology that we'll be revisiting frequently in this course. Before we do that, you remember last time I mentioned to you that one of the reasons I teach this course is to make you aware of when the popular press makes errors in science reporting. Well, the New York Times did us a favor uh, last week. They published an article having to do with influenza H5N1 research. And the headline is, this is January 23rd, 2013. The headline is, Research to Resume on Modified Deadlier Bird Flu. So this headline is incorrect. Uh, this refers to experiments that were done uh, over a year ago. And we will talk about these in more detail towards the end of the course. But the outcome of those experiments was not the creation of a deadlier bird flu. This is completely wrong. Now, the article itself is actually well balanced. It's by Denise Grady. But as you may know, the headlines are not written by the same people who write the articles. And so the headline writer, in this case, took liberty with the facts. In addition, on, ye on yesterday, Sunday, the New York Times ran an editorial on their main page about science, which is quite unusual. It's shown here. The bird flu experiments, it was called. They had also run an editorial about a year ago on this work, saying it should never have been done. And today, they were a little uh, more subdued in their recommendations. They said that an independent risk-benefit analysis of such research is still lacking. And I find this interesting because in science, one never knows the outcome of the work. And we will probably make examples of that over and over in this course, including today. You may have a question in mind to study, but you don't know what the answer is going to be. So I don't see how you can do a risk-benefit analysis. Anyway, if you find similar headlines that you think are wrong, save them, send them to us, and uh, we can discuss them. All right, on to the infectious cycle. The infectious cycle means, or is a summary phrase that means everything that happens uh, in an infected cell, starting from the beginning when the viruses enter the cell all the way through the whole process of making new virions and release of those virions from the cell. Now, uh, on this slide is shown the infectious cycle of one particular virus, poliovirus. And this happens to be the viruses that, that we work on in my laboratory. Now, this cycle is similar for all the other viruses in that family. So poliovirus is a member of the picornavirus family. And other picornaviruses would have more or less the same infectious cycle. But their details would differ. For example, the first step of the infectious cycle attachment to a host cell receptor that would be different for poliovirus and other members of the picornaviruses like rhinovirus, foot and mouth disease virus, and so on. We divide the cycle into steps only to make it easier for us to study the cycle. Because in an infected cell, everything happens in a continuum. And these steps are illustrated here by red arrows, attachment and entry. The next step shown here is translation. This happens next in a cell infected with poliovirus because the RNA that is released from the capsid is in fact the messenger RNA so it can be directly translated. But other viruses have DNA genomes and DNA as you know cannot be translated. You have to first make messenger RNA. So you can see right away how the infectious cycle can differ just depending on the configuration of the nucleic acid that's in the virion. The next step in this infectious cycle is genome replication. And again, we're making more RNAs. The next step is assembly. And we're making new particles. And then finally, release from the cell. <clears throat> this whole cycle for this virus, poliovirus, is taking place in the cytoplasm. But for many other viruses, 
the replication has steps that occur in the nucleus. And one of the things that I hope you will learn in the course of, of listening to us talk about viruses is that you can predict where things are going to occur simply knowing the configuration of the nucleic acid in the virion. You can predict the first step once the nucleic acid gets in the cell. You can predict where it's going to go in the cell and where it's going to replicate. All right, so the, the infectious cycle tells us a lot about what goes on in viral replication and it gives us a way to study each step in a logical way. Now, before we continue with our discussion today, it's important to define some terms that will come back over and over again uh, in this course. And they are terms that are not obvious in their meaning, so you, you'll simply have to try and memorize them. And there's just two of them, sus susceptible and permissive. And these refer to cells and their ability to be infected by viruses. A susceptible cell has a functional receptor for a virus. That's all susceptible means. Nothing is implied about what happens beyond the receptor. So in other words, the cell may or may not be able to support viral replication. Remember, the, the virus has to bind to a cell receptor on the cell surface, and then it has to get in and replicate inside the cell. So susceptibility only refers to whether or not there's a receptor on the cell surface. And if a cell is resistant, to virus replication, that's because it has no receptor. It may be able to support replication internally, and we can, we'll talk later about how to separate those two steps, but resistance refers only to the receptor. Now the other important term is a permissive cell. A permissive cell has the capacity to replicate virus. It may or may not be susceptible. We can separate these two experimentally again. A susceptible and permissive cell is the only cell that can take up a virus particle and allow it to replicate. So again, susceptible refers to having a receptor for the virus. Permissive or permissivity refers to the ability or the capacity to replicate virus. And as I said, these are not obvious definitions. They're sort of, they're almost arbitrary. You could have reversed them. But this is what we have. We have to memorize these two. And in fact, I'll tell you, many virologists get this wrong. I've seen papers where uh, they mix this up, unfortunately. Now, we, yesterday we discussed that viruses were discovered at the end of the 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, but for the first 40 or 50 years of virology research, these viruses could not be studied in cell cultures. They had to be propagated in animals, and a whole host of animals were used for propagating viruses. Some of them are shown here. Uh, even today, we still use animals to study viruses because we'd like to know uh, how viruses cause disease. And of course, to study disease, you can only answer that question in an animal model. But cell culture has largely supplanted the use of animals for pro growing stocks of viruses, for example, and determining how much virus is present, as we'll see in a moment. There is one animal, one experimental animal, that continues to be used today, and that is the embryonated chicken egg. And that's diagrammed here. This is a very convenient animal because it's delivered in a sterile uh, package, the egg, of course, the egg shell and within it is an embryo, and uh, many viruses can replicate in the various cells that are part of this animal. So, for example, you can inoculate, vi you drill a hole in the shell, and you can inoculate virus uh, into the allantoic cavity, which is the large one here, into the amniotic cavity, which directly surrounds the embryo, even into the yolk sac, and the viruses will replicate in the various membranes that are present. This isn't used any longer to study virus replication, although you can see here that many different viruses were once inoculated into uh, chicken embryos, or I should say embryonated chicken eggs. But we do use allantoic inoculation of influenza virus even today, particularly to grow uh, the large quantities of influenza vaccine uh, that are needed. And this is done in production, large production facilities where 10 to 12 day embryonated chicken eggs are inoculated by uh, 
machines. They drill a hole in the egg, they inoculate the virus, they seal the egg, and then they're placed in an incubator uh, for a couple of days. Uh, and then the virus is harvested. You get five or 10 mLs of fluid per egg, and uh, that makes about one dose of vaccine. <clears throat> now, it wasn't until 1949 that it was possible to study virus replication in cultured cells. And this is because John Enders, who's pictured here, and his colleagues Weller and Robbins, discovered that they could propagate poliovirus in a human cell culture. In particular, they made primary cultures of embryonic tissues. So you take a piece of tissue, you mince it and digest it with trypsin to make single cells. You plate them on a solid surface, a culture dish, and then you can infect them with poliovirus. So this was incredibly important work. This work led to, for example, the ability of Jonas Salk to make a polio vaccine, which was tested in 1954. And Enders, Weller, and Robbins received the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1954 for this important discovery. And you can see John Enders here on the cover of Time magazine. I believe this was 1961. Medicine gains on viruses. But he wasn't the first virologist on time. Uh, that was Jonas Salk, who in fact uh, was on the cover, I believe, in 1954. A very important cell line used throughout biology, not just virology, is HeLa cells. And these were cells made from uh, a young woman named Henrietta Lacks. Here are the first two letters of her first and last name form the name of this cell line. Uh, she had a cervical tumor. A piece of the tumor was removed in 1951 at Johns Hopkins Hospital. And George Guy, who was a a scientist interested in making cell cultures took a piece of that tumor and found that it made a wonderful cell line that grew forever and ever. It's immortal. And that is because it's a transformed cell line. It has viruses in it uh, that has transformed it and enables it to grow indefinitely. And if, if you don't know anything about these cells, you should read this book by Rebecca Skloot, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. It's a really nice dis description of the whole uh, story from taking the cells from Ms. Lax all the way to the present. We use these cells in our laboratory today and here's a picture of them on the right. There are a few different kinds of cell lines that are typically used in virus research. HeLa cells and many other cells. Here's an example of a mouse cell line. These are known as continuous cell lines because they will multiply indefinitely. As long as you keep splitting them and feeding them in the laboratory, they will grow. So they are immortal. They are transformed. And we'll talk about what that means in a subsequent lecture. And they're very useful. However, they're not normal. They have abnormal numbers of chromosomes. They are transformed. Uh, and so they have limited uses, although they've been used extensively. Another kind of cell line is a primary cell line. Here on the left is a primary human foreskin fibroblast. This is a cell line, a cell culture made from human tissues. So for example, you take some foreskin, you mince it up, make single cells out of it, plate them on a, a surface, and they will form a nice monolayer as shown here. And you can passage them. You can split the cells and, and passage them 20 or 30 times, but eventually they will die. Uh, only transformed cells, such as these 3T3s or HeLa cells, will grow indefinitely. So these are continuous cell lines compared to the primary cells. We also have what are called diploid cell strains. Uh, these are cell strains that will grow in the laboratory for longer than a primary cell will, perhaps 100 divisions. Uh, but they have normal numbers of chromosomes, so that's why they're called diploid, compared with the HeLa and the 3T3 cells. And these are typically, these diploid t cell strains are typically more preferable for growing vaccines than are um, continuous cell lines. In fact, we don't use continuous cell lines to grow vaccines for the most part. In the laboratory, these cell lines are grown in plastic dishes of all sorts, different sizes and configurations, individual dishes, multi-well dishes, flasks, 
and they're grown at 37 degrees in an incubator that has an atmosphere of 5% carbon dioxide which buffers the medium and keeps the pH around 7. In our lab and in some others, uh, cells can be grown in spinner cultures and this is a way to grow a large volume of cells and what is done is a glass bottle is used to house the cells. It has within it a glass rod from which is suspended a spinner bar. This is placed on a magnetic stir plate and the bar moves and circulates the medium so the cells grow in suspension, not attached to a monolayer. This is used to grow large quantities of cells and of course if you want to infect them with viruses you have to put them on a monolayer. In my lab we use lots and lots of monolayers of cells and so um, we use spinners to provide these big quantities. It's more convenient than using uh, plastic dishes. So when you have cells and you infect them with viruses, how do you know your virus is replicating in them? Well, one way is when the virus makes visible effects on the cells, and these are called cytopathic effects, or CPE. And here is a series of photographs of a monolayer of cells which have been infected with poliovirus, and you can see the progression of cytopathic effect here. On the upper left is an uninfected monolayer. You can see uh, cells right next to each other, healthy looking. And then after a few hours of infection, you see some cells are beginning to round up. Uh, by later an infection on the lower left, the cells have detached from the monolayer for the most part. And then finally, 12 hours later, uh, so the cells are beginning to lice as well. So those are three different kinds of cytopathic effects, rounding up, detachment from the monolayer, and lysis. So that's one kind of cytopath, three kinds of cytopathic effects right here, and there are many other kinds uh, that other viruses induce in cells. Another kind of cytopathic effect is the formation of syncytia. A syncytium is simply a giant cell with many nuclei that has arisen as a result of other cells fusing together. Now in many virus infected cells, the infected cells display on their surfaces viral glycoproteins that have the ability to fuse membranes. So this cell on the upper left is infected with a virus and it will fuse with a neighboring cell forming a syncytium with two nuclei and then that will go on and fuse with other cells and so then you have this giant cell with many many nuclei called a syncytium. On the lower panel you see a photograph of a syncytium with the arrow next to it and you can just about see the many nuclei in, in the center of that cell. So that's another form of uh, cytopathic effect caused by very specific viruses. Here's a list of some of the other cytopathic effects that are known to occur when viruses infect animal cells. There are a variety of morphological alterations, nuclear shrinking, proliferation of the nuclear membrane, vacuoles, syncytium formation, which we showed, rounding up and detachment of cultured cells, and on the right are all the different viruses known to carry out each kind of CPE. And also on the bottom left, another kind of CPE is the formation of inclusion bodies. Uh, these are particulate structures within the cell, either in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm. They can represent virions or subviral assemblies. And you can see Negri bodies, for example, virions in the cytoplasm. This is very typical of cells infected with rabies virus. So if you have someone who is suspected to have rabies and you have cells from that individual that have Negri bodies in them, that's a good, it's, it's very likely that, that that person has rabies. So the next question, we have, we have looked at how you would know that your cells are infected, but Sometimes cells don't display any cytopathic effect, so you have to determine whether there are viruses present in your cells or not. So how do you determine how many viruses there are in a sample? And there are two general ways that we're going to be talking about. One way is to measure viral infectivity. The other is to measure physical particles or components of particles. All right, so let's start with infectivity. <coughs> The plaque assay is, in my view, the most important way of measuring viral infectivity. And this slide shows a photograph of a plate uh, 
showing individual plaques. It was first developed in the 1930s by virologists who were studying bacteriophages, that is viruses that infect bacteria. In this photograph, what we were looking at is an agar plate. There's a lawn of bacteria that has grown on the surface of the agar, and wherever a bacterium has been infected by a virus, uh, those bacteria have made additional viruses which eventually spread and form a zone of killing on the monolayer. So each clear area is a plaque which simply represents virus killing of the bacteria. And this is a lytic bacteriophage, which is why it can kill the cells. So you can count each of these plaques and then determine the titer of the virus in terms of plaque forming units per milliliter, for example. And <clears throat> each plaque then, the assumption is, ar arises from an individual virus. And we'll talk about the logic behind that in a moment. This assay was then modified so it could be used for animal viruses. That was done in 1952 by Renato Dubeco, as shown here. And he received the Nobel Prize for this uh, in 1975 for this and other discoveries. On the upper left is his first plaque assay with poliovirus, and this has become a much more improved assay. This is very faint now. It's not a good photo. Uh, but he, his paper is shown here, Production of Plaques in Monolayer Tissue Cultures by Single Particles of an Animal Virus. So that's an important part of the title, by single particles of an animal virus. Uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. So this now allowed titration of animal viruses. This is 1952, not long after John Enders and colleagues had shown that you could grow poliovirus in cultured cells. So you can see Dilbeco jumped right on that discovery and said, look, we can do plaque assays, we can quantify viruses, and we can do genetics. And we're going to talk about that in the next lecture. To do a plaque assay, you have a, a tube of material that you think contains a virus. This can be a, a supernatant from infected cells, a clinical specimen, and then you make serial dilutions in a buffer. Typically we make tenfold serial dilutions, and then we plate a small amount of each dilution onto a monolayer of cells. We simply add 0.1 ml to the monolayer, we take off the medium, we add 0.1 ml of our suspected virus-containing solution, we allow the virus to absorb, then we cover the cells with a semi-solid overlay typically an agar-containing overlay with nutrients so that the cells can continue to survive. And then after a few days, we remove the agar overlay, we stain the cells, and then wherever viruses have infected cells and killed them, you see a clear zone or a plaque. And you can count each plaque and calculate the titer of the virus in PFU per mil. So here there are 17 plaques here. The calculation gives us 1.7 times 10 to the 8th PFU per mil, working back through all the dilutions. Now, you typically want a number, a plate with a good number of, pla of plaques on it that are countable, not too few because that's, uh, that's associated with too, uh, too much error. And if you have too many plaques, of course, you can't count them reliably. So you always plate a range of dilutions so that you hit one uh, with a good number on it. Here are some photographs of plaques to give you a better idea of how they look and how they develop. On the top is a depiction of what's going on when, you, when a plaque is growing. So we have a monolayer of cells. And say, in one part of the monolayer, one cell is infected by one of the viruses that we put on the cell. And that makes the cell infected. It's shown here as red. When that cell releases virus particles, those particles will then spread to neighboring cells and infect them and so on, and that focus of infection will get larger and larger. Now, because the cells are covered with an agar overlay, that means that the virus spread is restricted to neighboring cells. The, if you had a liquid overlay on these cells, the viruses would float into the medium, and infect all cells, and the whole monolayer would be killed. By having an agar overlay on top, you restrict the diffusion of the newly made viruses to a small area, and that's how you get a plaque. On the lower left is a microscopic photograph of a single plaque. And you can see the intact monolayer around the plaque. These are healthy cells. And then in the middle are the dead cells. They have rounded up and detached from the monolayer. And when you take off the agar overlay and stain these cells, this will become a hole in the monolayer. These rounded up cells will move away.
On the right is a plaque formed by a virus that contains a gene encoding beta-galactosidase. So this agar overlay has been uh, saturated with a precursor for the enzyme XGAL that turns blue when the enzyme is present. So you can see the virus-infected cells are turning blue. The ones on the outside of the plaque are still alive. The ones on the inside are uh, rounding up. Now, the next slide is actually a movie of the formation of a plaque. I waited for this movie for, for 30 years. It just came out a few years ago uh, by uh, Jeff Smith and his colleagues in the UK. And it really makes clear how a plaque is forming. So what they did was to set up a plate of infected cells and focused a camera on it. They found a single infected cell very early on in infection and then did, then did time-lapse photography, taking a frame every so often and put a movie together to show how a plaque develops. So you can see the plaque starts developing in the middle and then the cell death moves outward in a wave, in a circular wave. It's almost as if you dropped a pebble into water and you're seeing the ripple go outward. So again, the infection begins at the beginning and this movement that you see outward is the change in refractoriness of the cells as they die and detach from the monolayer. So that is over about a 15 hour period, the formation of a plaque. So this is what's going on in the monolayer. And then of course, if you remove the overlay and you stain it, you get a hole in the monolayer which is what is the plaque. This is what uh, another a plaque assay looks like. Uh, these are cells infected with influenza virus and you can see three different dilutions of virus and they, these monolayers have been stained with a dye called crystal violet. So it stains the living cells purple and then you can see holes in the monolayer where, where a virus has initiated an infection and gone through multiple cycles of replication and formed a plaque. Now an important question which was alluded to in the Dolbeco paper, how many viruses are needed to form a plaque? Dolbeco wanted to know the answer to that question very early on when he developed the plaque assay for animal viruses because it had important implications for doing genetics on viruses. If you only need one virus to form a plaque, you could make clonal stocks of viruses by taking the virus that, you, that uh, gave rise to a single plaque. The way you answer this question is quite simple. You do a dose-response curve. You make dilutions of virus, and you do plaque assays with each one, and then you plot the relative virus concentration versus the number of plaques. If one virus particle is enough to form a plaque, then the dose-response curve will be linear, shown by the red line because uh, it, this is one hit kinetics. One plaque, sorry, one virus is enough to form a plaque. So for one hit kinetics, the number of plaques is directly proportional to the first power of the concentration of the virus inoculated. So that's why you get a straight line. Most viruses follow one hit kinetics, i.e. one virus is enough to form a plaque. There are some viruses though that follow two-hit kinetics. When you do this dose-response curve, you get a curve such as the blue line here. And this is because for these viruses, you need two virus particles to form a plaque. And for two-hit kinetics, the number of plaques is directly proportional to the square of the concentration of the virus inoculated. These viruses have two-hit kinetics because you need two virus particles because the genome is in fact in two pieces and you need both parts of the genome to get in a cell to initiate an infection. And there are some viruses that need uh, three particles to infect cells as well. So that is showing us that for most viruses, one particle is enough to form a plaque. Now, another technique using the plaque assay is called plaque purification. It is a method for producing what we call clonal virus stocks. In other words, stocks of viruses derived from a single particle. I think you can see that in terms of genetics, it's good to start with such clonal virus stocks, although there are some limitations to this, as we'll see much later in this course. But when you start working with a virus, typically you want to plaque purify it, make a clonal virus stock, to ensure that uh, everything that you work with is homogeneous. 
we usually do this multiple times. We take a plaque assay with nicely isolated plaques. Remember, there's an auger overlay on this. You take a pipette, you plunge it into the auger right over one of the plaques. You can, and this is, of course, before staining them. You can actually see most plaques through, through, uh, by just holding the plate up to the light. You put a pipette in here. You take a little plug of auger and you put it in buffer and the virus will come out of the auger. And then you repeat this two more times, this whole process, because there is some chance that a plaque might have been formed just accidentally by two virus particles. Even though one virus is enough to form a plaque, by chance sometimes two viruses will infect a cell. And you want to not, if you want to make a clonal virus stock, you, you have to not do that, so you do it a couple of times. Some viruses do not kill cells or they don't form plaques. Uh, so we have to have other ways of measuring their infectivity. And one way is illustrated here, the endpoint dilution assay. And what's done here is to infect uh, a number of cells with different dilutions of virus. You can see here we've made 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 7 dilutions of virus. We infect small wells of cells. Each of these wells in this 96 well plate has a monolayer of cells in it, and we put in each row uh, the separate dilutions in multiple multiple samples. So, for example, row A, all of the rows and well, or sorry, all the wells in row A contain the minus two dilution. All the rows in all the wells in row B contain the minus three dilution, and so forth. So you infect these cells with the dilutions of virus. You incubate the plate until replication has occurred. And then you examine each well and say, is the virus causing cytopathic effects? Whatever happens to be the CPE for your particular virus, rounding up of cells, syncytium formation, anything else. And you score for cytopathic effect. And that's what's shown on the table here. You can see that uh, a plus means that cytopathic effect was observed, that the low dilutions, all of the cells show, all of the wells show cytopathic effects. At minus four, then we have one that didn't. And at minus five, you have one, two, three, four, five wells uh, without cytopathic effects, and one, two, three, four, five wells with cytopathic effects. And then as you dilute further, most of the wells are negative. So what the end point of this assay is the dilution at which 50% of the wells are infected as judged by cytopathic effects, and that would be 10 to the minus 5. So we would say this virus stock contains 10 to the fifth tissue culture infectious doses 50% or TCID 50. And that way you can standardize your virus stocks and compare them among experiments. Now this is very convenient that I have put the 50% endpoint right at a dilution of minus 5. In reality, uh, it, it rarely ends up that the 50% point is on a, uh, an integer dilution. <clears throat> so you have to use math to calculate. The actual TCID 50 comes out to numbers like 10 to the 5.5 or 6.5. Another important concept having to do with virus infectivity is the particle to PFU ratio. And this is very simple. This is simply the number of virus particles in a sample divided by the number of infectious particles. So if I have a sample of 100 infectious particles and there are 100 virus particles in that sample, then the particle to PFU ratio is 1. It turns out that this P particle to PFU ratio is about 1 for many phages, but it's high for many animal viruses. And this makes it difficult to study uh, animal viruses. So let me explain that to you. Here's a chart showing particle to PFU ratios of some animal viruses. So for example, for adenoviruses, that ratio is between 20 and 100. That means, say, for every 100 particles, only one of them is infectious. So one out of 100 particles is infectious. So if, remember, a particle means a physical virus particle. And infectivity is measured, say, by a plaque assay. That's why we have particle to PFU ratio. For some animal viruses, the number is low. It's 1 to 2. So if for some leaky forest virus, almost every particle is infectious. But for papillomaviruses, only 1 in 10,000 particles are infectious. 
This is a complicating variable because if you are studying an infected cell, you often don't know if whatever it is you are measuring is a consequence of what the total particles are doing or just the infectious ones. So let's say you're taking pictures of viruses moving into cells. How do you know those are actually infectious particles and that is a actual productive pathway? So it makes things complicated. There are ways to work around this, but you have to be aware of this. Now, why is the particle to PFU ratio so variable? Why is it that for some viruses it's one and for other viruses it's 10,000? Well, remember, first of all, rem let's emphasize what this means. We know from this dose response curve that we talked about not too long ago that a single virus particle can initiate infection, right? A single particle can initiate infection. The linear nature of the dose response curve tells us that. But the high particle to PFU ratio of most animal viruses tells us that not every virus is successful. Even though a single particle could be infectious, not every one is. Sometimes only one in 10,000. Why not? We don't really know, but we have some ideas, and three of them are listed here. First, some particles are damaged when they're made by the cell. Uh, we may make them in the laboratory in cells, but we may damage them in a, in a variety of ways by all sorts of conditions. So that may make them not infectious. Uh, many genomes may have mutations in them that render them not infectious. It may be a byproduct of replication that you make a lot of genomes with non infectious uh, mutations in them. And finally, uh, I think the complexity of the infectious cycle probably is a big factor. Remember in the beginning of this talk I showed you a, an infectious cycle with multiple steps. Now in order for a virus to reproduce it has to go through all of those steps in the right order and at the right time. And if you make a mistake or you fail at any particular step you don't complete the cycle so you may make an aberrant particle. So this may be another reason why the particle to PFU ratio is high for many animal viruses. Now let's talk about how we study uh, viruses using the infectious cycle as a tool. And what we, what we do in, in virus laboratories is to use what's called a one-step growth cycle. And this is a technique developed in the 30s by, again, bacteriophage virologists. And in particular, Max Delbrook and Ellis Emory Ellis uh, published this in 1939 where they showed how do you do a one-step growth curve or growth cycle on bacteriophages of E. coli. Now Max Delbrook was a physicist who came to biology, he got interested in biology, and then came to virology in particular because he could make it quantitative as he was used to in, in studying physics. So he developed this one step growth cycle and what he would do he would take a culture of, of E. coli shown here the blue cell he would then take a, a culture of phage and he would absorb the phage to E. coli in other words allow the phage to attach and then he would dilute the culture so no more adsorption occurred and so you make a dilute culture so now the likelihood that a phage is going to attach to a bacteria is very low and now you incubate the culture and you take samples at different times after adsorption and you measure virus infectivity by plaque assay. Now what did he get when he did this experiment? On the left is a graph showing uh, the results that he got when he, s he infected all the cells in a culture. So he put a lot of virus in so every cell would be infectious. So we're measuring with time the number of infectious particles produced. So you can see initially when he, just after adsorption, and he dilutes the culture, for a period of time, he didn't detect any virus infectivity. No plaques are formed uh, from, these, from these infected phage uh, bacteria. He called this the eclipse period because it was a period during which no, no infectivity could be detected. And then the number of infectious particles would begin to rise. They rose rather quickly and plateaued. He called that the burst or yield. He called it burst because it happened very quickly in, in bacteriophages and it's a, it's a term that has stuck even though for many viruses uh, the burst period is much longer. So what's happened here is that the virus are infecting the cells. They're making the parts during the eclipse period 
to make new virions. And then once the parts are assembled, then the viruses are formed and they're infectious. So you can't detect any infectivity while the parts are being made because there's no infectious virus yet. And then once the parts are assembled, you get infectious viruses. Now this is the situation on the left when you infect all the cells in a culture. Sometimes he did experiments where a few cells in the culture were infected, and then he got the pattern shown on the right. The same growth cycle, measuring with time the number of infectious particles. You can see the dilution of the culture at the start. You have an eclipse period, then a burst, but then a plateau and a second burst. That's because you have multiple cycles of infection going on here. In other words, you only infect a few cells. You have a few cells infected, they go through an eclipse period, they make virus, and then that virus that comes out of those initially infected cells goes on and infects other cells in the culture. There's an eclipse period there, and then a burst where the second cells produce virus. And if you dilute the inoculum greatly, you can have multiple uh, bursts. All right, so this was subsequently adapted to animal virus infected cells, and that's the, an experiment shown here. So this is a, a growth cycle of adenovirus in a mammalian cell culture. Adenovirus is a rather large DNA-containing virus. Uh, and again, you infect cells, you allow virus to absorb, uh, you then dilute the culture, and you take samples at different hours after adsorption and measure plaque-forming units per mil. And again, you see there is an eclipse period where you can't detect any viral infectivity. Now, in this experiment, we've done one thing different from the previous one, which was the phage bacteria infection experiment. Here, we are measuring both intracellular and extracellular virus. So what you can do in these growth cycle experiments, at each time point, you can remove the cells from the medium and measure the virus inside the cells, simply by cracking them open. Or you can measure the virus in the medium that is the virus that's been released the cells, and that's what's shown here, extracellular virus versus intracellular virus. So the eclipse period you see is shown on the intracellular virus curve. Then there's a rise in the production of virus particles and eventually a plateau. But if you look at the extracellular production of virus, there is no virus outside of the cell until after 16 hours post-infection. And that allowed investigators to define another period called the latent period. That is the period during infection when no virus is released from the cell. So the eclipse period is the time when there is no virus produced at all inside of the cell. And then there's a period uh, between 12 and 16 hours where viruses are being made, but they're not yet released from the cell. That's the latent period. Now again, the, the important point here is that virus multiplication is fundamentally different from the way bacteria multiply. When bacteria multiply by binary fission, one bacterium becomes two, four, uh, eight, and so forth. They divide by binary fission. So if you inoculate a culture with bacteria, there's no lag or a very small lag uh, and then uh, immediate growth. So there's no eclipse period during which you don't find bacteria. There are always bacteria present. They're simply dividing. And again, just to go back with viruses, remember there's an eclipse period during which you can't detect any infectivity. That's because new viruses are being made by making the parts and then putting the parts together. A fundamental difference between virus and bacteria. Viruses assemble by making the individual parts and putting them together. Bacteria divide by binary fission. And this confused scientists for many years because they assumed that viruses and bacteria would be similar. And it wasn't until Luria, sorry, Ellis and Delbruck uh, developed this one-step growth analysis that it became clear because of this eclipse period that viruses were fundamentally different than bacteria. Now, when we do these one-step growth studies, we infect all the cells so that they go through the cycle at the same time. That is the key to these growth cycles. It's what we call synchronous infection. In other words, you have to infect all the cells so they go through the cycle all at the same time. 
So you get sort of a magnification of what goes on in a single cell by the whole culture. You're looking at the, a population of cells all doing something at the same time, so it makes it easier to see what's going on. If every cell was at a different part of the cycle, it would be hopelessly confusing. So how do you know that we have infected all of the cells? That's the key here. So for this, we need to do a little mathematics. And this has to do with what we call the multiplicity of infection. MOI is simply the number of particles added per cell. It is not the number of particles that each cell receives. We'll, we'll see in a moment how you figure that out. So for example, if we have a million cells and we add 10 million virions or virus particles to those cells, the MOI is 10. It's simply a division of 10 to the 7th by 10 to the 6th. This does not mean that each cell will get 10 virions. In other words, it doesn't mean, an MOI of 10 does not mean that every cell will have 10 virions attached to it and get in. That is determined by a, a mathematical calculation. The reason for that is that the infection of cells by viruses is a random event. It depends on collision of viruses and cells happening randomly. You add virus to cells, they're moving around, and sometimes they will hit cells and sometimes they won't. So when you mix cells with virus, and here the word susceptible comes up, that means they have a receptor on their surface. Some cells will not be infected, some will get one particle, some will get two, some will get three or more. Think of it this way, we have a hundred buckets in a room and you have a hundred tennis balls in your hand. If you could throw them all at once, every bucket would not receive one tennis ball because where they're going is a random event. Some buckets would get no balls, some would get one, two, or three. The mathematical equation that we can use to figure out how many virus particles each cell receives is the Poisson distribution. This is a distribution that uh, can inform us about low frequency events like this. Here's the Poisson equation. Uh, PK is simply the fraction of cells infected by K virus particles. That's what we want to find out. How many cells get how many virus particles? And the way you do that is you use this equation e to the minus m. m is the multiplicity of infection. Uh, and k, again, is, is the, the number of virus particles. So it's e to the minus m, m to the k power over k factorial. So we can simplify this and show you some of the examples here. For example, uninfected cells is p0. That simplifies to e to the minus m. Cells receiving one particle, p1, is e to the m times e to the minus m. And multiply infected cells, p greater than 1, can be calculated by this formula. So for any multiplicity, 1, 0 0.1, 10, 5, 100, you simply put the multiplicity of infection in, into this equation here. Uh, wherever you see m, you put the multiplicity of, of infection in, and you solve, and you get either the number of uninfected cells cells receiving one particle, cells multiply infected. You will get it as a fraction, and then you can calculate the number of cells depending on how many you're starting with. So let's see in, in practice how that works. If you infect a million cells with an MOI of 10, and you use the equations from the previous slide, you will determine that 45 cells are uninfected, 450 cells are, receive one particle, and the rest get more than one. So you can see right away that at an MOI of 10, all of your cells are essentially infected, almost a million, subtracting uh, 45 plus 450. And so that's why if you want to synchronize infection in a culture, you use a high MOI 10. You could use 5 as well, but we, we use 10 to be sure. A million cells infected at an MOI of 1. 37% of the cells are infected, so about a third of the culture is uninfected and the rest are infected, getting one or more particles. So here you could do a, a, a multi-cycle growth curve. You would have several, you would have an initial production of virus from these uh, infected cells here, but 37% of the cells would be uninfected, they would get virus on the next cycle. If you infect a million cells with an MOI of 0 .001, 0.00, that is, you add 
0.001 PFU per cell. 99.9% .9 of the cells are uninfected, but some are infected. 990 receive one particle, and uh, somewhat less receive more than one particle. So a very small fraction of this culture, this million cell culture, is infected. So you will have many cycles of infection, one, two, three, four, or more, depending on how many particles each infected cell makes. So you can really study multiple cycles if you want, or you can study just one cycle. So multiplicity of infection lets you manipulate uh, your one-step growth cycle. Now for many viruses, we can't conveniently measure infectivity. We can't do plaque assays or even limit dilution assays. And so we're reduced to using other measurements. And in some cases, you can measure infectivity, but some of these approaches that I'll tell you about are uh, more rapid. And we'll talk about um, four of these today. There are five listed. We won't talk about electron microscopy. This is taking photographs of viruses, of course, at very high magnification. This would be useful in looking at new viruses that you're discovering, see what they look like. Um, but also, if you want to know how many physical particles are present in a sample, you can count them by the electron microscope, and there are ways to know how many particles are present. So, for example, if you have a, a new virus you're discovered and you want to know what the particle to PFU ratio is, uh, you have to look at it under the electron microscope. So let's talk about hemagglutination uh, and measuring viral enzymes, serology using antibodies, and then measuring nucleic acids. Hemagglutination uses red blood cells to detect virus particles. Uh, it's based on the idea that red blood cells have receptors for some viruses, and they will bind to them. The viruses don't replicate in them, uh, so red blood cells, you could say, are susceptible but not permissive to infection. Uh, but they will bind and they will act as an indicator. So hemagglutination for measuring influenza virus particles was developed in 1941. It was the first assay for eukaryotic viruses. The idea here is that red blood cells will bind influenza viruses. So for example, this single red blood cell on the left will be coated by influenza virus particles, and then that red blood cell will bind to others by virtue of the virus particles on the surface and so on. And you make a lattice, which forms a very nice uh, sheet in a 96-well format such as this one. So again, you add viruses to red blood cells if viruses are present in your sample, uh, the red blood cells will agglutinate. Uh, the virus, again, will not replicate in the cell. We're simply attaching the virus to the receptors on the, on the surface of these red blood cells. Now, at the lower left is a 96-well plate showing a hemagglutination assay in practice. We call this an HA assay for short. And what we have here, A, B, C, D, E, et cetera, are different virus samples. And then there are dilutions, two-fold dilutions of each sample uh, along in the columns. And you can see here, for example, virus sample B has no virus in it. There's no hemagglutination. When there's no virus present, the red blood cells within 20 minutes tumble to the bottom of the well and form this nice little button. If virus is present, the, the red blood cells form a lattice which coats the well, and you can see a very nice lattice here, and in this one as well. So this, let's say this sample right here, sample D, is hemagglutinating HA positive out to, uh, let's say, 512. That's the last well where we can see hemagglutination. So the HA titer of this sample is 512, the reciprocal of the, high, the uh, highest dilution at which you get uh, hemagglutination. Now you see the earliest wells, the lowest dilution of these samples, which are HA positive, have little buttons in them. What does that mean? Well, as we'll talk about later, uh, influenza viruses not only can attach to red blood cells, but the particles, the virus particles have an enzyme in them that reverse that attachment, have an enzyme that cleaves the virus from its receptor. So at very high concentrations of virus, this is apparently an HA negative reaction because this enzyme is very active. But you see as you dilute it out, you get hemagglutination. If you incubated this plate for another half hour or so at room temperature, all of these wells would turn HA negative as the enzyme cleaved off the virus from its receptor on the red blood cells. This is why we read the HA assay very quickly. Another way to measure 
uh, virus particles, again, this is not infectious virus. The HA assay does not measure infectious virus, but simply viruses that are attaching to red blood cells. Another way we can do this is to measure enzymes in the particle. Many viruses have enzymes in their particles of various sorts. Uh, some have, many have nucleic acid polymerases, which can be readily assayed. So retroviruses, which are shown here in an EM on the left, and schematically on the right. These are enveloped uh, viruses, and in their capsid within the envelope is a enzyme called reverse transcriptase. It's the blue dots here. And this copies the RNA genome into a DNA. We'll talk about that in great detail later. This enzyme could be readily assayed for simply by adding a substrate, say, and a precursor so that nucleic acid polymerization can take place. So if you have a sample suspected to have retroviruses in it, you treat it with a little bit of detergent to permeabilize the membrane so your precursors can get in. You add labeled, radioactively labeled triphosphates and some, some uh, magnesium, for example, uh, and then they will pass through the permeabilized membrane. And you also add a substrate that can be copied and the enzyme will copy the substrate into a radioactively labeled product, which you can then detect. And the next slide shows you an example of that kind of detection. Uh, here we have three different cell lines that are either mock infected or infected with a retrovirus, either undiluted or at 1 to 10. And uh, these are samples taken at different days after infection. And it's, these samples are simply cell culture supernatants. They are then mixed with a little detergent, some radioactive triphosphate, and other materials uh, so that the reverse transcription can take place. And then the products are filtered on filter paper so that you can detect them by autoradiography. So you can see here some of these samples, uh, some of these cells are producing infectious retroviruses as determined by um, the incorporation of radioactivity by the particles. I shouldn't say infectious. They're producing retrovirus particles that have enzyme in them. Uh, this doesn't tell you that these particles are actually infectious. You can see this cell line is not producing any retroviruses, uh, and this cell line is at a lower rate than, uh, again, I've said infectious retroviruses, but I mean retrovirus particles. So that's an enzyme assay that you can use to detect um, retrovirus particles. We use antibodies extensively in virology. One is to detect the presence of viruses and viral proteins in cells. And here's an example of one way to use uh, antibodies. This is a procedure called immunostaining. In this procedure, we have an antibody which is directed against a virus protein. You can make these by immunizing animals with viruses or virus proteins. And then you incubate the let's say, infected cells in this case with your antibody and then detect the viral protein by the presence of the antibody. So in this is a, in panel B is a cell monolayer infected with a herpes virus and the cells have been stained or incubated with an antibody to a herpes viral protein. And there are two ways that you can detect the presence of the antibody binding to your viral protein, either directly or indirectly. You can label the antibody itself with a fluorescent indicator so that the uh, indicator will fluoresce, say, when you put ultraviolet light on it. There are many different ways that you can detect this, either by UV or other ways, uh, dyes, chemicals of various sorts. You can either directly add this indicator to the antibody or you can add the indicator to a second antibody that will then bind to the first, which is in turn bound to the viral antigen. So what the picture is showing is um, an antibody that is used to detect herpes virus proteins. The antibody is labeled with a, uh, a fluorescent indicator that becomes green under UV light. So you can see the viral proteins here in the nucleus. This uh, cell monolayer has actually been stained with two different antibodies at the same time, one against the viral protein, the other against a cellular protein to show uh, the cytoskeleton. And that's been labeled with a different color indicator, that one indicator, that one's in red, of course. Now, antibodies are used in many ways in virology besides immunostaining. 
uh, we use a procedure called immunoblotting or Western blot analysis. And here we can tell uh, the size and abundance of viral proteins, say, in a sample. Uh, so in this experiment, we have placed samples of virus-infected cells and fractionated them on a protein gel. So this is, uh, these, these proteins, the individual proteins are separated according to their size by an electrical current uh, passed across the gel. The gel is then taken out of the apparatus and placed in a apparatus where we can then transfer all these proteins to a membrane, a sheet. So this is called a blotting tank. Uh, you have the gel in here and uh, on top of it is placed a sheet of either nitrocellulose or some other membrane uh, and then the proteins transfer to the membrane. You take then the membrane out of there, you put it in a tube and you add your antibody. And wherever proteins are attached to the membrane, if they react with the antibody, you can then eventually detect them. You have, you have antibodies with indicators on them that will then give you a signal, say, on an x-ray film. So of all the proteins that were separated, if these were, say, infected cell proteins, you can tell which ones are viral uh, by them being detected by the antibody on this western blot. And you can see this is very powerful. You can not only see the size of the protein, but you can do kinetic studies where you make samples at different times after infection, and you can see when proteins are made in infected cells, when they're turned off, and so forth. So quite powerful for research. This is also used in the clinical setting. It was used early on to diagnose uh, individuals with uh, human immunodeficiency virus infection. Another use of antibodies is the ELISA, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. This is often used for rapid diagnostic tests as, as well as other uh, research-based assays. And in this assay, we can either look for uh, the presence of a viral protein in a sample, that's shown in A, or the presence of an antibody in a sample. All right, so let's say you have a specimen, say a respiratory, a nasal wash, and you want to know if there is influenza virus in it. What you do is you have a plastic surface or some other synth synthetic surface on which you have attached what are called capture antibodies. These are antibodies against the, uh, one of the influenza virus proteins. And then you flood that structure, that solid support, with your respiratory specimen. If there are viral proteins present, they will bind to the antibodies that are on the support. And then you use a second antibody with an indicator to detect the presence of the viral antigen. Now, if no viral antigen is present, that indicator antibody will not bind and you'll get a negative result. But if viral proteins are present, uh, the second antibody will bind and you'll get some kind of a readout, typically a color change of some kind. And uh, many of the rapid dipstick type uh, in-office tests uh, done for virus infections are, are built on uh, this kind of an assay. Now in other situations you want to know if an individual uh, has antibody to a virus. So typically if someone has had a virus infection and you'd like to know that person has recovered uh, and you'd like to know what they're infected with, you take some serum and you look for antibodies to the virus. In this case what's attached to the solid support is some viral protein that you've produced and purified. And then if you pass the serum sample over this solid support, if there are antibodies to the virus, the antibodies will stick to the viral protein. And again, you detect the presence of those attached antibodies with a second antibody that is attached to an indicator. Again, some kind of color change that will result. So that's what an ELISA is because you're linking uh, the reagent to a solid support and you use some kind of an enzyme to detect the presence of either protein or antibody. Now this is used extensively in research in many ways but we also use it as I said in the clinical setting and uh, used in, in particular in some in-office, in-physician office rapid uh, diagnostic tests. Uh, fluorescent proteins have found a wide use in virology research. These have revolutionized the kinds of things that we can do. The first green fluorescent protein, of course, was discovered in, in jellyfish. Uh, and the chair of biology of here, or the former chair of biology, as you may know, uh, received the Nobel Prize for his work on GFP in uh, C. elegans. Uh, 
Um, many other derivatives of GFP have since been made and other isolates have been discovered with different colors and there are all sorts of uh, not only greens but reds and magentas as well and these can be used to detect uh, virus infected cells in real time so in contrast to antibody based tests where you typically uh, may have to destroy your sample in order to stain it with your antibody there's some exceptions but Typically, it's, uh, it's an invasive procedure that terminates your infection. With GFP, with the fluorescent proteins, you can monitor infections in real time and not interrupt the infection. So you can take a culture, let's say you have put a, a, a green fluorescent protein gene in your virus genome, so the virus now expresses it. You can infect cells with that virus, and then at different times after infection, take the infected cells out of the incubator and look for the expression of green fluorescent protein. You simply put the cells under a UV microscope and look for fluorescence. And then you can put them back in the incubator and then look again later. So it's real-time detection and it's non-disruptive. This is a very interesting experiment shown in this slide where what we see in the middle is a cluster of uh, cells in a monolayer and they have been infected with various herpes viruses that are carrying uh, three different, one of three different color fluorescent proteins. And there is a range of colors you can see here, and that is because uh, the cells can be infected with multiple green or red and blue viruses and form uh, shades of intermediate colors. And so by calculating all the different shades of colors that were produced in the infected cells, starting with three different colored herpes viruses, they could calculate the maximum number of viruses that could ever infect the cell, at least with this particular herpes virus. Here are two other applications of, of uh, fluorescent proteins to uh, virus research. On the left, uh, what's been done is to insert the gene for a green fluorescent protein into the genome of a herpes virus, uh, and then this herpes virus is used to infect a rat, and the virus is neurotropic. It replicates in neurons, and you can see here this beautiful neuron where the cell body and the axons and dendrites are full of green fluorescent protein that's been produced by this virus that is producing the GFP protein. And you can actually map the neural circuitry using these viruses. You can very precisely inoculate uh, these viruses with a needle into a particular part of the brain and then map where that, those neurons are connected to elsewhere by simply tracing them by the green fluorescent protein. Really interesting approach. We can also see now single virus particles. We have high resolution microscopy coupled with the use of fluorescent proteins can visualize individual virus particles. That's of course because the light amplifies their size. And here on the right uh, are individual particles of human immunodeficiency virus. They're in green within a cell. Uh, and the cell has been stained with an antibody to the cytoskeletal network. So you can see these, these uh, fibrous looking structures are part of the cy cellular cytoskeleton. And these viruses are actually moving along individual microtubules. So the green virus is moving down the microtubule. We now know from these kinds of studies and others that when viruses move within the cell, they do so by moving along the cell cytoskeleton. Really remarkable. Uh, here is a movie uh, showing an infected neuron and by a herpes virus ex that is, uh, has incorporated uh, green fluorescent protein into the virion itself. So you can see in the cell body it's full of individual virions but in addition the virions are moving along the processes. Here in this particular part you can see the, the individual virions moving away from the nucleus. It's remarkable. So they're made in the nucleus in the cell body, sorry, not the nucleus. This is the entire neuron cell body. They're made in the cell body and then they move outwards and that's how they get to other neurons, and that's why you can trace them in part. Really remarkable technology. Another uh, technology I want to mention for a couple of reasons is polymerase chain reaction. 
Uh, this is a way of detecting very, very low quantities of nucleic acids in a sample. And it's based on the idea that you use a DNA polymerase that is thermostable. You mix uh, primers with your sample. So let's say you're looking for a virus. You design nucleic acid primers. And then you take them and you add the primers to your sample. You denature whatever nucleic acids are present. And then you do a round of DNA polymerization using this heat-stable DNA polymerase. You then, after the elongation, you have a product made. You then do another round of denaturation and annealing to primers again and more extension. And eventually, you get exponential growth of the product made by your two primers and that thermostable DNA polymerase. So this is a very sensitive technique that can detect small amounts of DNA and even RNA if you first convert it uh, to DNA. It's used extensively in research. We use it in the lab all the time. It's used in industry to make recombinant DNA products and it's used for diagnosis of viral infections. This is another game changer in the world of science in general but particularly in virology and microbiology. It's allowed us to do so many things that we couldn't do before. The whole technique, PCR, its presence is really uh, based on serendipity. Back in the 1960s, a microbiologist by the name of Thomas Brock was very interested in these hot springs that are present throughout the country, particularly in Yellowstone uh, National Park. These are very, very hot waters. They, tend, they can also be uh, extreme environments in terms of pH. He isolated in the environment a bacterium called Thermus aquaticus. And he thought it would be interesting to study how this bacterium uh, could live in these extreme environments. And it turned out that the DNA polymerase from this bacterium, as you would expect, was pretty thermostable. And so in the 1980s, Kerry Mullis and his colleagues thought of using that DNA polymerase for this, making this PCR uh, scheme. So you need to have a thermostable DNA polymerase because there are multiple cycles, often 30 or 40, of annealing, elongation, and denaturation. So the enzyme has to be able to withstand the denaturation step, which occurs at 95 degrees Celsius. And what better enzyme than one from a hot spring? So Tom Brock had no idea that his enzyme, his bacterium, could, be, could revolutionize uh, molecular biology. And it just, again, is another example of how, with research, you never know where your work is headed. Sometimes you think you do, but quite often you're surprised. And this is another example of surprise. Another revolution uh, that we enjoy, so we've had um, PCR as part of the revolution, um, and we have had another one here called deep high throughput sequencing. Now we've had the ability to sequence nucleic acids, that is determine the order of A, C, G, and T for a while now from the late 70s. And in fact, um, this is how we used to do it. We used to run sequencing reactions out on gels and make autoradiographs and then read them by hand. Uh, I did this as a postdoc for the poliovirus genome. It was the 7,400 and 40 nucleotide RNA molecule, and I determined its nucleotide sequence. It took me one year to do that. Today, this could be done in 10 minutes because we have very rapid sequencing approaches that are incredibly fast. You can sequence millions of bases in hours, but also deep. They have very high coverage of each molecule, so you have very high accuracy. Deep high throughput sequencing. So this picture is not deep high throughput sequencing. This is the, the hand stuff that I used to do years ago. Uh, nowadays you can do much more. This has introduced a whole new field of what's called metagenomics. You can take samples from the environment, you can take clinical samples, and sequence all of the nucleic acid in these samples. And you can know all the bacteria and all the viruses and what other microorganisms or other forms of life are present in them. So we can identify new viruses in environmental samples. You can get sewage and see what's, what viruses are here. You can take your gut bacteria and sequence in them and say what bacteria or what viruses are present there as well. 
And that's because you can sequence a lot in a very short period of time with great accuracy. You can also use this to identify new pathogens. You can take someone who has an illness, you don't know what's causing it, you can take samples from those individuals, sequence and look for new agents. So this again, I, I may say, say it too many times, but this has revolutionized uh, molecular biology, uh, the ability to do this. Now recently on TWIV we talked about two examples of pathogen discovery uh, using these high throughput deep sequencing approaches. If you're interested, listen to these. 196, an arena for snakes. A brand new virus which seems to cause a, a long known disease in snakes. We talked with Joe DeRisi who is a virus discovery person at UCSF and he uh, was sent a photograph of a snake by a young lady who had it as a pet and the snake was sick. He got interested in this snake disease and ended up finding a new virus by deep sequencing. In episode 199, we talked about uh, a, a new tick-borne virus found in two patients in Missouri who had severe uh, febrile illness. These are two farmers who had a history of tick bites and a, a similar febrile illness. When their specimens were sequenced, they found a new, uh, the same virus in both of them uh, in Missouri, which may cause this disease. So again, another way that you can use deep sequencing to discover new pathogens. Uh, last year, uh, an article was published uh, which showed that illegally imported wildlife products that people try to bring in uh, from other countries into the US, for example, also often contain viral sequences. So people go to exotic places, they collect animal parts, heads and arms and so forth, such as these. They try and bring them in the country. Most of the time they are confiscated and the CDC decided, let's look in some of these to see if uh, any viruses are present. And so uh, the, the laboratory of Ian Lipkin, another virus discoverer, uh, this time at, at Columbia University, uh, collaborated with the CDC. and They found, in fact, that many of these uh, products have viral sequences in them, viruses of all different sorts. Now, we don't know if these are infectious viruses. The work didn't report any recovery of infectious replicating viruses, but there are viral sequences which suggest that at some time or other there might have been uh, viruses infecting these animals. I mean, these are monkeys and uh, and apes of various sorts who at one point in their lives probably were infected by one or more viruses as we all are and so uh, you have to be careful when you bring these in these could be infectious and they, they could cause infections I do have a little quibble with this headline in the Times from the jungle to JFK viruses cross borders and monkey meat well we don't know if there are actually infectious viruses there we only know there are sequences and whether they're infectious or not remains to be discovered. Uh, anyway, another, another way that uh, we can use these techniques for discovering new viruses. And that's all for today.